Welcome to another video from Dr. Lock. I wanted to talk about wiring up a locksmith van and what's involved in it and how to do it and how to do it safely and neatly and in a way that other people can follow, repair and you'll get plenty of use out of it. And I wanted to show you some of the things to avoid so that you can avoid burning out your van or having electrical issues in the future. So let's do a quick overview of um, how we wire up vans. We're not all electricians, all electricians have their own way as well. And if you like or disagree, please leave it down in the comments. Okay, let's wire up a locksmithing van and let's go with the fundamentals. Okay, so a good place to start is just with a blank canvas. We're gonna start with a blank empty van and we're gonna throw everything we can at it. So we're gonna throw in a GPS, we're going to throw in a GPS tracker, so a tracking unit that you can activate and deactivate the car with, tell you where your employees are. Then we're going to throw in a car kit, give you better reception, charges your phone when you've got it in the dock, also does the hands-free function as well. Uh, reversing camera or reversing rear view mirror, some cars have them, some cars don't, some have it in the stereo. We'll throw in a fridge as well, why not, we're throwing everything in here. So we'll throw in a fridge so you get nice cold drinks while you're driving and when you're finished. Some amber lights, very helpful if you're actually working in and around traffic. So we're going to throw as much as we can here and then we're going to wire them all up. Reversing camera, sorry, reversing lights so that that way when you reverse you can see it in your cameras properly. Also some leads in and some leads out. So this would be if you need to give a jump start to another vehicle or if you wanted to charge your vehicle at the end of a shift. Moving on now to some more other things we're going to throw on, what about some driving lights along the side? Driving lights along the side, very good for advertisement, also good in rural areas and to be seen on the road, especially at night. Now that's only the really the 12 volt side of things in the front. So now let's look at some of the 240 volts or mains power stuff. You're going to need a duplicator. You can get 12 volt ones too, but we'll assume we're going for the, the full package. Then you're going to have a code machine, then you're going to have a wave machine, then you're going to have a laptop that's going to need to be charged. Then if you really want you can throw in a bench grinder. Some people have them, some people don't. And we're just throwing everything you could possibly think of at this particular scenario. Then in the back you'll have your 12 volt setup which basically throws in um, let's say a little die grinder, 12 volt. Let's throw in a whole heap of lead lights so you've got good lighting in and around your truck at the back. If you're like me, I'll throw in a stereo, I'll throw in a fan, and I'll throw in an RW4. You're going to need to clone keys. And then we'll throw in a DeWalt charger so we can charge the batteries. Let's throw in some USB um, charging points and also the cigarette lighter socket so that, that way you can charge. Uh, what about some headlights? Well, we forgot the headlights at the front. Let's throw in some headlights at the front, driving lights so that you can see and um, bringing all our other stuff back on screen now. So you can see when you start wiring all of these devices up and you're talking different systems of 12 volt, sorry, yeah, 12 volt and uh, 240 volt, or if you're in the US, 115 volt. Sometimes you might even be uh, doing multiple voltage. I do multiple voltages in my van. I've got a 115 and 240 and 12. Or you might even have a truck that's starting off on 24 and you might need to convert it down to 12. We won't do the conversion down, but what we will do is we'll start off and we'll do the wiring for all of these things on screen and wire them up safely. And look at what's needed to do it and how we're going to do it. Okay, so step one, how are we going to do it? I advise going for mains power, but you can do it on 12 volt as well. You're not going to be able to have the quality of machines or the high usage machines that we showed before, but it can be done on a very small scale on a 12 volt system. A lot of locksmiths use a 12 volt system, but if you're going to be serious about it, you probably want to get an inverter in there and be able to use mains power. So for this example, because we're going all the way and it's an example, we're going to be doing an inverter when we're going to be having mains power as well as 12 volt power in this vehicle. Okay, so step two now we've identified what type of system we're going to use and what type of power we're going to be drawing for it and what type of machines we're going to be running off this thing. I think it's time we go for a dual battery system. To have one battery in your car is okay to drive the vehicle, but to draw good amounts of power from that from that particular battery from the front of the car and then expect the car to actually run properly is just unrealistic. So to have a dual battery system allows 
the first battery which comes with the car to actually maintain the car, keep you running so you're not stuck on a job site with a flat battery and a dual battery system allows you to drain that second battery down as far as you want, as much as you want. When it's finished, it's finished without compromising your car's running ability. So we definitely need a dual battery system. Batteries come in a wide different different makes, different models, different technologies. The best ones I find are the ones that are suitable for RVs or boats and uh, glass matte I believe is the is the one it is. There's different ones such as nickel metal hydrate, um, there's that new lightweight one as well that likes to explode. I find the gas matte ones, uh, sorry, uh, litho iron I believe is the new one, very lightweight, a lot of, lot of power in it but um, yeah they can explode if they're shorted out so I like glass mat they're good for the price they same same weight as all the other batteries you know it's not a bad battery for what you're actually getting and they last about five years I found five years with constant abuse you don't run them all the way down you've got to keep charging them all the time and I found in this type of scenario that those batteries work very good and I've had some that go to eight or nine years so really depends on what type of battery you get. You don't want to get a battery that is going to uh, create fumes of any description. In the back of your van you've, it's kind of sealed and if you're creating any hydrogen from the battery charging this is not the type of gas you want inside your vehicle. So I like the glass mat ones because they're completely sealed and you can mount them on uh, just about any angle or side. They don't leak and you don't have to worry about fumes or discharge of any nature. So step two, let's get ourselves a good battery. The next step I want to talk about is the inverter. Now we've started to purchase things, we've already got our battery, we'd need an inverter. So sorry, going back to the battery, um, as many amps as you can get, 100 will do, 150 is better, 200 even better. So if you're going to be running the type of tools that we showed you originally, uh, let's say that you've already started off and you've got yourself a 200 amp battery. So now we need to choose an inverter. So you can't just run anything with anything. Everything is actually calculated. So to run all the machinery we showed you before, not all at the same time, but one at a time, you're going to need a decent inverter. A decent inverter with pure wave, not modified wave. You want pure sine wave. Once you've got a decent inverter, you know, well, you need to actually also work out what size you're going to need. And this is where Ohm's law comes into it, and you need to work out how much each machine is likely to pull. If you're using two at a time or one at a time, how much you're actually going to be needing. For the machines that we showed you before, such as the Silco Futura, the Silco Matrix, and the Silco uh, Bravo, you'd be saying those type of machines are generally speaking between 1,800 to 2,500 2 watts. So if you were looking at that as far as how much power, what type of inverter you would buy, you would need to buy one that can accommodate that and also the startup load, the, uh, what they call the spike. Because when a lot of electrical motors start up, they draw a lot more current than what they do when they're actually running. So if you've got a 2000 watt motor or machine and you've got a 2000 watt inverter, you can actually be in trouble when it starts up. You might be able to run it barely, but you do need you know, an extra extra thousand there just in case. So if it adds, if it looks like it's two thousand on each machine, and you're only going to be running one machine at 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 one time, I would say go for three thousand, three and a half thousand watt. At least that way you've got the extra power for startup and any any sort of problems. Also, you might be charging, um, you might be using one machine and then using a power pack at the same time, which will also add to the wattage. So best to get as much as you can, anywhere from two to five thousands desirable to run the type of machines we're talking about must be pure sine wave and you also do need good cable as well the cable for the inverter is definitely a must you're going to be running some big juice through it so you want some fat cable something about the size of jumper lead cable size if not slightly larger you can get this from um, a lot of different shops or boating shops you get some very decent size cable the next thing i recommend would be putting in a very heavy chunky switch uh, something like a 200 250 amp mechanical switch so that if anything does go wrong you can always isolate and you can also turn off the inverter as well when you're not using it some inverters come with uh, remote little keypads or remote displays that you can just push a button on and off or eco modes 
I like to just do it the manual way and just turn it with a $20, $30 switch. So I recommend having a real big heavy duty switch with those ring terminals on it that's completely insulated. Uh, that way when you want the inverter on, you can turn it on. Allows you to run two different systems, uh, one being 12 volt and one to 240 volt or 110 volt. The next thing you might want to do is buy some power boards. The power boards, uh, you probably don't want too many, just one or two power boards would be sufficient for the back of a van. I recommend getting the ones with the switches on them, at least that way you can turn on what you do want to turn on because you don't want everything plugged in and automatically taking juice and your inverter having to produce that power so you're better off just ha turning on what you need at least that way you're using less power and the inverter is not going to struggle on startup uh, one other one other thing about the power board was uh, that particular one had USB ports on it so that's probably a handy little feature uh, having those USB ports on there as well they don't cost much more probably five dollars more and you get USB so well worth having Okay, step four I'm going to put down as parts. You need to now go shopping and get a whole heap of parts to make all of this work. I'll run through um, going, let's let's start from uh, clockwise. Number one position, electrical tape. Try and get your electrical tape in different colours, uh, preferably red and black. If you can get a little yellow and a little blue, it doesn't help. It helps you identify a particular type of circuits. So use your uh, red for positive, black for negative. You can use your yellow for your lighting and you can use um, blue and green for some accessories and things along those lines. Next thing is to get fuses. Get yourself a whole heap of the blade fuses. Buy a big huge pack of them. At least then you've got plenty of them and if you blow any along the way you've got replacements. <clears throat> battery box. A battery box is you can do without it and actually build one but you want your battery to be in something insulated that's not conductive so that nothing, no tools, no hacksaws, nothing can fall onto the battery. Uh, many van fires have started by things dropping onto batteries. I had a van fire in um, one of my vans. Uh, it was on an alarm battery and um, I was using somebody else's van. All of a sudden I smelled smoke and it was one of these uh, alarm batteries, deep cycle alarm batteries. It actually just shorted out on a coat hanger and it starts burning and that's pretty much how it starts. So a box to put your battery in is a must if you can get it and you also need to mount that battery down. Um, the battery can't be movable in, in the event of a crash. I like to use uh, like seatbelt type material, those ratchet straps and put some good anchors on the vehicle and then use those ratchet straps to attach the battery to it. They're very multifunctional, flexible. They seem to keep it in there nice and tight. Next thing I'd be saying is get yourself another heavy duty switch. This time this will be for the 12 volt systems. We already got one for the 240, but get another one for the 12. These big switches, marine grade switches are really excellent. They, I think they're called battery isolating switches. They've got the ring terminals on the back. You just screw them up. They come in a nice box. You can add multiple ones to it. You can get ones with different functions. So they're really good. Uh, next thing down there at about the four o'clock position, that would be uh, what I call a flywall uh, insulating grommet. So basically you unscrew the front, you unscrew the back, you drill a hole through a flywall um, which is between the motor and the cabin, you put it into the piece of metal, you cap it on one side, you cap it on the other side and it allows you to f feed a cable through there and uh, the cable won't actually touch the metal then. So if you were to drill a hole and put a cable through a metal flywall or something on a car, eventually that cable will cut through and it will touch the car body which is a negative and then you'll get sparks and things happening there so a good insulating grommet between one to the other heat shrink is really an excellent um, insulator as well a whole variety of them in different colors would really help you out on this installation the next thing here down here at like the six o'clock oh, yeah almost six o'clock position this red box here with this blue um, little fuse in there is actually a fuse fuse terminal now what makes this one so good is you actually connect it straight at the battery. So for your auxiliary battery, you're going to need one of these because you want to, straight from that positive terminal, you want to bolt this on. What you've got to do to bolt it on is just um, undo the positive terminal and screw it down through. With uh, deep cycle batteries, they're different to normal car batteries. You don't have like a little nipple um, 
pushing out and then a cap that you squeeze over the top with deep cycle batteries have actually got a screw thread on them and you, you um, screw the screw through there with a split pin a sp sorry a split washer and that helps it not rattle loose so a good fuse box right at the battery if anything goes wrong this will be your last line of defense between the battery and whatever else is going okay uh cabling this is just at the almost seven o'clock position cabling i like to use uh, twin sheath uh, cabling which means that the cable not only has a protective red and black on them it also has another coating over the top of that this just gives it that little bit more protection when you've got cables inside a car and they're moving backwards and forwards or things might be touching them or you just you just don't know so the more they move backwards and forwards when things rub they eventually do kind of work their way through uh, some you might have something heavy push against it or cut into it and you just don't want anything to really cut into your cables so i like to use twin sheath wherever possible especially for running reasonable amounts of power the next thing is you're going to need a fuse box now i know we've already got one fuse box but that fuse box was for the battery this is another fuse box this fuse box is to run all your accessories so this particular one you want at least 10 slots on it at least for a locksmith fan you can get as many as you want but don't get less than 10 in my opinion you're going to need a whole heap of connectors now we're just in the eight o'clock position looking at the other uh, connectors connectors you're going to need you're going to need spade ring um, a whole heap of them it's good just to have them there especially when you're doing this type of installation because you're going to be connecting up a wide variety of uh, different different um, instruments appliances and tools so we're going to get into the wiring as well but we're just looking over going through the steps before what we need to get started the next thing here in the nine o'clock position are saddles saddles these are rubber insulated saddles you get them pretty cheap online these days or from china um, what you do with them is you actually when you attach them to the car they've got this rubber around so that won't actually cut into whatever it's holding it makes it a little bit better the next thing here about 10 o'clock position is what uh, we call split conduit this is a flexible how do you say hose which has a cut going down one side of it so you can grab all your cables and just feed them into this and work it, work along that cut uh, that cut down the middle and this actually in cases or the electrical cable making it nice and neat so on a typical van installation i would go down and i'd buy 20 meters of um, all five different sizes and that's definitely going to be um, handy what that does is it just protects all the cables it keeps them neat keeps them out of the way protects them and it's the right thing to do uh, you're going to need a soldering iron that goes without saying uh, you're going to need to possibly borrow a crimping tool uh, for some of the o-ring connections some of them are quite big and you do need to compress them the tool i was using was i believe two ton hydraulic crimping tool um, that i've used I, I bought it once because um, nobody had one i bought it and it was amazing the amount of times i've used it crimping cables of this nature um, yeah there's no other way to do it. a couple of ton you need to just crimp it with the right head on it you can buy the terminals very cheaply from your electrical store and the cable you can purchase as well but if you can't attach one to the other you're not going to get a good connection and you don't want those things pulling apart soldering is okay but crimping with two ton of crimping with two ton and doing it properly really is the way to go okay so that's the part list we're going to need to do all the electrical wiring let's move on to the next step okay so step five let's look at the dual battery system and i've put all these ones together as far as to say well this is most likely going to be situated under the bonnet so these are the some of the parts in this installation that i'd be looking for under the bonnet the first one is a circuit breaker now this one here um, you need to know really how, how many amps you're going to get a lot of the time i just put in a 50 amp one or a 30 amp one they're not very big but you shouldn't be taking that many amps off the car anyway in most circumstances the way this dual battery system works just to break it down and make it nice and easy is your car has an alternator the alternator charges your battery as you use and drive you can use and drive your car the battery gets used and it gets replenished via the alternator which charges your battery at certain stages your battery will have enough power and the alternator will produce less if you need more power the alternator will produce more so the idea is that once your original car battery is charged this dual battery system will then take some charge and start charging your secondary battery so that that way when your 
first battery is completely charged, you've got power now going to the other one and vice versa. Uh, if you ever have a flat battery, a lot of dual battery systems, they have a button on it that you can push. What that does is it links the, front, uh, the back battery with the front battery so that you can drive the car. Let's take, for example, you leave your headlights on and now you're you can't drive away from the job site and your car battery is dead or you haven't driven your car in three to five months and your car battery is dead by having a dual battery system means that you, you can link one battery to the other and then you can actually start the car doing it that way provided that you're using decent decent sized cabling so um, let's go back over at three o'clock position yeah a circuit breaker um, that goes from your battery to the actual uh, dual dual charge dual charger or it's really known as a battery relay dual charging system or battery relay so that goes from the battery to there anytime you connect onto a battery you need to have a fuse on the battery side of things in case things go wrong so that's why I put a circuit breaker there uh, then you have your dual charger you need to mount that somewhere under the bonnet preferably um, it does have terminals on it and they you can buy kits and they have like little rubber grommets and things like that but it's a sort of appliance that you got a big uh, you know positive and positive on the other side it's a big couple of terminals on it I like to put it under the bonnet it's a, in, in an area there that won't really get um, touched or uh, nothing can touch it because everything's kind of fixed comes with a nice little mounter kit a lot of them do now with uh, dual battery charging systems there are different options there's ones that are simple relays there's ones that um, have nice little LEDs and little lights and a button to override um, those ones that's the type that I got in my vehicle didn't cost me too much cheapest I could have got was about 60 I got about a hundred or one most expensive one I could have got was about 350 now the 350 dollar one too I have purchased one of them and they're more of a smart charger what they are is a little box and it receives the power you can charge off solar panels as well and it allows you to charge multiple di sorry different types of batteries with this particular type of battery we're talking about a glass mat with this type of relay you'll be you'll be fine there's no problems there but if you were charging uh, like lithium ion batteries and maybe a hydrate battery as well and you know you've got multiple batteries and things then yeah I would go for the more expensive um, charger but you don't really need it in this instance um, lastly on the list nine o'clock position is cable ties cable ties under the bonnet come in real handy especially when you're cabling in uh, just a little bit of cables there you can attach it to other wiring harnesses um, so basically you connect it you put your conduit around it some electrical tape around um, some parts there to keep it all nice and neat and then you can actually uh, saddle it in just using cable ties cable ties are acceptable I mean they even use cable ties on helicopters to keep camera equipment and all sorts of cabling and pipes and things on the helicopter on uh, military helicopters so I mean if they can run run it on military helicopters with conduit and um, wire. if they can run wiring on military helicopters like that we can do it in the front of a, a, a locksmith vehicle for sure okay so they're the uh, things you're going to need under the bonnet as far as dual battery system so let's move on to the next step okay let's get into some wiring now so you're going to need your soldering iron your crimpers your conduit your saddles and your heat shrink for this one we're basically going to start at the car battery which is already fitted into the vehicle now this should be in the front in most work vans so we're going to go from the car battery to a circuit breaker the circuit breaker needs to be mounted as well preferably on a non-conductive surface uh, you can make up an L bracket and insulate it uh, that's normally a pretty good way or bolt it in somewhere that it's not going to move so you need to go from the actual car battery to this circuit breaker try and keep the circuit breaker as close to the battery as possible you do not want the length of cable to be far or anything along those lines if not you'll have to put another fuse on the actual car battery side of it but if you mount this right at the car battery then this is the fuse and then you can move on to your dual battery system so keep that circuit breaker right at the positive terminal of your car battery moving on now we're going to move on to the dual battery uh, system or relay as it's known from your circuit breaker you run a cable to your relay once again you need your crimping round connectors to actually crimp the terminals and then screw them on tight oh sorry they're, they're nuts so you bolt it on tight uh, make sure you use those little split rings because you don't want these terminals vibrating loose or coming loose there is a lot of vibration in the car you will also now need to mount that dual battery relay 
um, or dual battery system. You need to mount it in such a place where it's not going to touch anything, it's not going to be in the way, it's not going to get water damage or anything along those lines. Somewhere along the flywheel is desirable or somewhere that's just out of the way and won't get won't won't get hit by or cause any trouble. Next you'll need to drill a hole through the flywall and actually bring the cable from this charging uh, dual battery system or the charging relay through the actual car uh, using good ca good cabling and once again conduit uh, you'll need to saddle it or um, zip tie from the relay through the wall um, and then possibly under the carpet and all the way to the dual battery system which will be living in the back of the vehicle most likely. Um, some people are lucky they can actually fit a dual battery system in the front of their vehicle uh, which doesn't really change much in this scenario but means you won't have to run a cable from um, the front to the back for the charging it just means you'll have to run a, a cable from the front to the back for the actual power. So this will like this what I'm showing now will run power from the main battery when it's full all the way to the back battery uh, to allow it to charge. So where were we? Um, okay, we're through the flywall, we're using good twin sheath cable, we're using uh, conduit, a bit of electrical tape here and there, keep the conduit in place. Now we need to connect up to um, the actual fuse box and you'd want a, a reasonable size fuse there, probably 30, 40 amp, and then you connect to the battery. Um, the reason we do this is, well, the reason I do it is because if that cable gets, if that cable gets, uh, how do you say, fractured or cut or earthed out, um, I want to blow the fuses on both sides of the equation. I don't want one fuse to still be connected or anything along those lines. If it blows, let's say, in the middle, let's say you cut the cable and it earths out, I want it to blow on my secondary battery, so then that, that becomes isolated and no power will come through it. And then I also want it to blow at the front. And we don't know about that relay circuit. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Maybe they will stop, maybe they won't stop. But you want, it's kind of like a piece of string. Um, you know, if you cut it in the middle, which way is the juice going to flow? Well, it's going to flow both ways. So it's good to have a fuse on both sides. That's my recommendation anyway. So that's your charging circuit right there. That's going to bring juice from the front of the vehicle all the way to the back of the vehicle. Let's move on to uh, step six. So here's a wiring diagram for the dual battery system or the dual charging system. You've got your main battery here on the left going through a circuit breaker. The positive then goes over to the, the relay or the dual charging system. Then it goes from the relay to another little fuse and then it goes from the fuse over to the battery and the battery is also earthed by the car body and also has an earth terminal and same with the main battery of the car goes everywhere it needs to and is also connected to the earth so both batteries share the same same earth and it goes through the circuit breaker through the relay and to the second battery and this is how the battery charges itself okay so step nine now we're actually going to be connecting up the inverter so this is our secondary battery here and we've already done the mounting we've already done the the charging system now we need some really heavy duty cables to come from the secondary battery and over to the inverter because this particular inverter is going to be pulling quite a lot of juice so the first thing at the battery I would be putting is a circuit breaker on the positive side and then from the circuit breaker I would be moving along to a switch remember this switch should be rated for probably 200 amps I would say so pretty heavy duty sort of stuff and then from the switch I would go into the inverter unless you want to have your inverter on all the time which I don't recommend or unless it's got some sort of eco mode or remote panel I like to just use a nice big hefty switch turn it on turn it off now with the earth line from the secondary battery that goes to the inverter and then from there it also goes to the car body I like to earth the car body on on this because it's a really big cable and it keeps the inverter earthed as well now on the back of on the back of the inverter there are some connections you will need to use those round crimping connections you will need heat shrink they will need to be well insulated and protected don't allow anything to actually touch those terminals fall down the back of the inverter or accidentally fall and you know get shorted out remember your car body is a negative so the back of these inverters the way a lot of the time they are is they have too big sort of like nuts on the back. You loosen them off, you put your O-ring on, you tighten them up, 
and then they're there. They sit right side side by side a lot of the time. My best advice would be to make it in a nice non-conductive box, wood, plastic, um, you know, keep these terminals sort of away from everything and don't make it in such a way that nothing can ever fall or touch inside the, behind those big cables. If it does, worst case scenario, you do have that circuit breaker on, but 200 amps or, or um, 100, 100, 150 amps or 50 amp circuit breaker, 50 amps is a lot of juice to have to, to you know, spark out before it's actually going to break the circuit and that fuse is going to work. So don't rely on that. It is there as a safety, but don't rely on it because fires can start well before that. Okay, so that's the inverter installed now. And one more thing. Uh, key, uh, key machines give off a lot of brass angle grinders give off a lot of dust and things so when you do mount this particular inverter take note of where your air holes are for your inverter you want the inverter to be well ventilated but you don't want to be collecting any dirt so you don't mount it right down the bottom where all the dirt and brass collects in the bottom of your van or in one little corner that nobody ever can vacuum out because it's too hard to get to you don't want an inverter um, a machine like this to be in that type of environment. You want it to be clean, well air ventilated, no chance of shorting out and no chance of overheating or collecting dust within the internal parts. Moving on. Okay now moving on we've got our inverter mounted up and as you can see there I've just done a little red line for where the inverter will sit so that way we can keep it all nice and easy to understand. So we've got our secondary battery here so the negative terminal goes up into a connection block or a bus as it's called and for that one there you would use a good size cable as thick as you can and then connect it up to the terminal there. Uh, moving to the positive side now this terminal block that I'm showing you here is one of the new ones this actually bolts straight onto the battery and has two uh, fuses on it. So for the inverter you would use a nice big uh, solid one, I forget which one I use in my vehicle, I think it's 100 or 150 amp. And then for the secondary circuit which is the 12 volt circuit, I'm pretty sure I'm using a 30, um, 30 amp. And the charging circuit in my particular vehicle also goes through that one as well. So you've got your 30 amp and a 150 amp, it, the amperage will vary on what sort of equipment you're using. So for example, if your inverter is bigger, you're going to have a bigger size fuse. If you're running a lot of 12 volt accessories, you're going to have a bigger size fuse on the 12 volt side. I'm just showing you this terminal block here. So this fuse block, uh, the belt mounts onto the battery, has two. It has two fuses there ready to just go straight out and then you just connect straight onto them. So let's follow the path of the 12 volt one more time from the battery to the fuse box fuse block which is mounted onto the battery from there over to a switch uh, like I said before I just like to have the switch turn everything on turn everything off if ever any ever a problem any issues you can turn it off and that's directly from the battery to everything else uh, that way you're not sort of chasing your tail and also I like it when I turn it on everything comes on and when I turn off everything comes off so nothing's left on or off that you're not sure about Moving over now to a fuse box. Now this particular fuse box is the one that I like. It has a main central positive which goes straight through it. So there's a big connection right down the bottom. So you'd use good size cable from your fuse to your switch to your switch to your fuse box. Good size cable that can pull more than enough for everything. Uh, from there it goes up to the fuses and you've got these little connections all along the side here. I mean you can get fancier fuse boxes than this too. This is quite a cheap one but very functional one. On the side here you see all these little silver terminals. From there you connect your wire going to your switch and then from your switch to your load uh, indicated by the light bulb there. So basically what happens is that when you go to use your system you turn on your big switch then power is applied to all your appliances here and you can toggle them on or off via your switches and they will work once they've uh, been toggled on or off. Now some things to remember when you are powering a load you need to know how many amps that particular load is and use suitable cabling so if you've got something like 50 amps you're not going to be wanting to use little tiny uh, figure eight or speaker wire you're going to need some something reasonable make sure you your cabling can pull enough amps that goes back to that V over um, I over R if you can't do all that just do what everyone else does just use Google and um, what 
uh, amp conversion and you put it in there you just simply put in what the wattage is what the power is and all the specs you got and it'll convert it for you then when you're selecting your cable you can select the right cable same with your fuses too look on the side of them some are rated very lightly uh, some are rated quite heavily so you want something with more than enough if you if you're running a 20 amp circuit and you got a 20 amp fuse and you're pulling 20 amps through it chances are it's going to heat up so try and get double or triple when it comes to those type of things that way they're not going to heat up they're not going to burn out fuses can get little um, arcs in them as well when the power is being flicked backwards and forwards so you want you want something heavy duty so that's basically our 12 volt side here so we will go from the fuse to the switch to the fuse box to to a switch and then back out to the load and then we would repeat the process of the switch and the load the switch and the load the switch and load all the way around so we would have our lights we would have our stereo we would have um our fan we would have our cigarette lighter socket we would have our rw12 anything 12 volt would be coming off this circuit right here okay so step 11 i told you we'll be wiring it all up so one thing there well actually two or three things there that we had would actually require use of a of a relay and these lights are no exception so we're going to be pulling power from the secondary battery for these particular headlights and this goes the same if you're going to do reversing lights or if you're going to do the warning lights on the top of the vehicle you'd prefer to pull them off your secondary battery leaving your main battery always for driving so that way you're never going to get stuck anywhere the lights can really wear down a battery quite quickly even if um, even if you're driving normally and you have these lights on your one single battery they can actually take quite a bit of juice if you know if, the, if you've got a lot of lights and they're extremely bright so let's keep it separate let's just wire them up to the secondary battery so from let's start with the negative the negative goes straight to the bus which we've already connected in the 12 volt installation so from there we can run a suitable size cable from our headlights to the actual bus and pick that up uh, from there we can also um, so that that would be the negative let's go back to the battery now let's go to the positive we've got that uh, fuse right on the battery terminal there from there i would run a secondary fuse the reason i run a secondary fuse is most likely your headlight uh, fuse is probably going to be 20 amps but their other fuse is probably going to be a 30 amp so by running a little bit of cable and a secondary fuse that fuse would mainly be or that fuse is only for your headlights so what that means is that if your headlights get compromised or blow it's going to blow that fuse uh, which is lower than the fuse which is connected to the battery there which runs the 12 volt system okay now from the fuse we move over to what's called a relay the way a relay works is if it's basically a giant switch which is power operated so that on that box you have your positive and negative so we're getting negative from the chassis right here and we're getting uh, positive from from the battery to the fuse to the second fuse to the relay now from the switch of the light what we need there is we need the trigger trigger positive so this trigger positive when power is applied to it um, it goes down the line and goes to the relay and then operates the the relay as basically a big huge switch so from your main switch on your car you will have some place to hook in depending on what type of car and all these sorts of things depends on where you want to hook in best to seek some advice on that one because all different cars are different I don't want to tell you to hook in the wrong place and uh, it cause you any damage so basically you just need a trigger wire from your from your light switch you can normally pick it up around the column from there I would run a fuse because you're tapping into your actual original wiring I would run a fuse just to make sure there's no problems and nothing's going to go wrong this particular fuse I'd only be running in probably a three or a five amp very very small and I would go from my light switch my car originals light switch to a fuse a very small fuse down to my relay and then um, on the other side of it I'd apply power via the earth so what actually happens is that when I flick that switch on power comes down that line activates my relay which then allows power to flow from the main battery to my front lights and when I turn my light off on the dash it closes the circuit 
sorry, opens a circuit and the power turns off. So you can basically say a relay is just nothing but a, a giant big switch. So when your switches don't have enough power to run the voltage or the amperage through them, you use a relay because the relay is designed for high, amp, high amps to go through. And it's uh, pretty much just a, a trigger, electrically triggered switch. That's all the relay is. So we'll do that for our headlights. We'll do that for our uh, warning lights on the top. We'd do that for the reversing uh, reversing camera, except we would be hooking it into the reversing circuit, which you can normally pick up in your tail light as well. In your tail light there, you'll have a reversing light. You can normally pick up, because it's only low power, do the same, exact same thing, and that would be your reversing circuit as well. Headlights, reversing circuits, that would be those ones. Even if you're running some very high amperage uh, 12 volt equipment in the back of your van, you might choose to run a relay uh, in this configuration in in the last uh, diagram that we looked at as well. Most of, the, most of the switches you can get should handle most things, but if you're talking big amperage, then yeah, a relay is definitely needed. In conclusion, this is just an overview of how to design an electronic circuit for your locksmithing van. There's nothing worse than getting it wrong and when you get it wrong with electric sometimes you get it really wrong you can end up with your vehicle on fire you can end up with all sorts of problems blowing your equipment and if you blow your equipment the manufacturer is not going to be able to take it back so make sure you follow some of the steps which we've, we've uh, outlined if you find there's something that you know better or you know how to do it better please leave a comment down below it's always good to see how other people do it around the world and if there are better systems out there, which I believe there is, then please list them down below. Or any points that you might have, please list it down below. The idea is to give you some sort of ballpark figure about what you're up against, what type of parts you might need, what type of system you can use, and uh, just generally outline a system that you could install and use. You still will need to Google and do some research on particular products. With those little sticker products on the side of the uh, on the side of the machine, read them, add the watts up, go go to the Google um, conversion, find out how many watts, how big your cable is. There's nothing worse than being in traffic and your van up smoking or going up in flames. There's a couple of a couple of small things now I just want to say really really quick and the first one is every uh, car has a fuel tank. If you're in diesel you're a little bit safer but if you're using petrol then you need to take note. With all the shelving and all the screws and all the fittings that are on certain vehicles it's not uncommon to have somebody or some smart person install a shelving or install something and drill straight through the floor straight into the fuel tank. A lot of car fuel tanks are plastic which means you wouldn't even notice it when you drilled straight through it. This being the case fuel is flammable and any fumes that come out of that or slowly leak out of that can be flammable so with your wires and connections you really need to do a neat and tidy job keep them tight make sure they don't touch the earth of the body otherwise you can end up with sparks if you end up with sparks and you've got a slowly weeping fuel tank with fuel vapors you can be in trouble so you don't want anything like that if you're working on a new van great but if you're working on an old van take note you don't know what's gone on in the future and I would say possibly stick your head under there, have a look, see if uh, anybody's drilled through the floor in that location of where the fuel tank is. Because when you're running big electrical current and you're running inverters and things along these lines, you don't want any fuel vapors in the back of your vehicle. The next one is um, batteries create hydrogen when they charge. There's no two ways about it. Unless you get a sealed battery, it will create hydrogen. A lot of locksmiths always try and uh, cut corners, keep costs down, and I understand that. So if you decide to go for standard car batteries or car batteries which do emit some sort of um, vapor or some sort of gases, you need to have that in a ventilated area or some way of ventilating it. If you have your, your back of your van and you have a battery that's not ventilated, or one that emits gases and then you're in there turning things on and off even a power drill commit emits a spark when you pull the trigger so you really need to make sure that you use the right systems I suggest um, glass mat sealed sealed batteries I find them great mount them any which direction but you do have to be aware if you are going to start cutting corners the system I've designed uh, or roughly shown you right here is quite an expensive system and I understand you might change things to suit your budget or suit your needs 
but a lot of the products there that I've chosen and the way that I've wired them up, especially with the dual switches and the extra fuses and fusing it from the battery and things along these lines uh, is what I'm trying to uh, get you to take from this. And also your wiring, protect your wiring, make it rock solid, double insulated, double sheath, electrical tape, saddled, uh, zip ties to... There's a big difference between neat wiring and um, ugly wiring, which is referred to as spaghetti in the in the in the trade. So you don't want a car full of spaghetti. It's going to be too hard for people to track. It can lead to other problems down the down the line. If you are going to do the job, do it well because your van. Every time you turn it on, every time you pull that type of current, you're going to be appreciative that your electrical. Um, electrical parts are going to be doing what you need them to be done i strongly suggest once again against uh, sorry i strongly recommend a dual battery system nothing worse than being on a job site and being stuck there because you because you've cut too many keys a dual battery system gives you much more freedom you can use uh, an inverter and if you need to change your power to step down or step up you can do that as well so if you've bought your machines from overseas you can just put in a simple 30 40 dollar step up or step down and power them as well so in conclusion that's uh wiring up a locksmith fan leave your comments down hang on a sec i forgot to tell you something so basically fuse everything fuse everything make your terminals good and make sure your cables go from big to small so from the battery you want a good size cable and then work it a bit like a spider web so you start off with a big cable where you bring your main power through you go down to another fuse box and then you break it off into smaller then you run smaller cable then you break it off into smaller and you run smaller cables as well so an example of this would be from your main battery you have a massive cable going to your inverter and then from that terminal you can start to break it off into let's say 30 amp and then you run your lighting circuit from that 30 amp wire which is fused down to maybe 5 amp keep your fuses small if you blow them you blow them you can always upgrade the fuses later putting two bigger fuses in can cause you trouble so basically start off at, at the top 200 amp 3 uh, 150 50 30 10 20s and then work work your way down basically everything needs to be fused and it needs to be in in order so don't just uh, jam a 100 amp fuse in there and then run everything off that 100 amp fuse because it won't work. You need the 100 amp fuse at the top and then below that system you need the next fuse. Below that system you need the next fuse and each time you step down in a system just put another fuse in, put another fuse box in, put another row of switches. That's the best way to pretty much do it. So fat cable from the from the start, smaller, 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 smaller as it works down to the appliance. You might be running a light that will only take very little voltage. You can run a very small cable off it. But that goes up to the next stage, which has the next size fuse. And that goes up to the next one, which has the next size fuse. I like to think of it as a spider web. Some people like to think of it as a family tree. Uh, but basically, yeah, you start from the top and you work your way down. And each appliance that you're adding to that tree make sure you're fusing for that appliance so if you're using uh, let's say an electric drill uh, 30 watt 12 volt electric drill you would have a suitable fuse for that and then on the next circuit if you've got a radio it takes a 10 amp fuse you would have a 10 amp fuse for that so what the idea is behind it is if things really go wrong there's a whole heap of fuses in the line that go up towards the battery uh, before you would actually trip so yeah and when you do blow a fuse i mean i've blown fuses all the time i put a i put a two or a three or a five in there something really small i see if the appliance um is going to blow it and if it does blow it then i move up to the next one up and you move up in very small increments but if you really want to know you just look at the appliance and you can work it out you can put a multimeter across the appliance and work it out but if when in doubt use small small fuses because they blow faster and that's the whole idea to prevent any further damage Okay, thanks for watching.